politics for the program this afternoon. My name is Sierra Harkey and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The SAB is a bipartisan group. As a member of the SAB, I get access to many great opportunities by being involved with the Institute. If you are a KU student and are interested in joining, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. For this afternoon's event, if you would like to know more about our guest, the event itself, upcoming Institute events, and more, you can download a printable program handout. The link is in the YouTube event description. At the end of the event, we will have time for you to ask questions of our guest. Please type your question in the YouTube chat box on your screen. Please hold all questions until the end of the program. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Questions that are distracting, disrespectful, or attempt to dominate the chat will be deleted and the user will be removed. This afternoon's program is closed captioned for the hearing impaired. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Lou DeMarco. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Lou DeMarco and I am a professor at the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College. And I will be presenting uh, a short presentation on the 2006 Battle of uh, Ramadi uh, in Iraq. So the fight for Ramadi 2006, a turning point in the US war in Iraq. The Battle of Ramadi took place in 2006. 2006, we were, the United States was three years into uh, its occupation of Iraq uh, following the 2003 invasion. Battle of Ramadi took place in Western Iraq in the El Anbar, El Anbar province. Uh, Ramadi is the province capital. Uh, at the time in 2006, uh, the situation in Iraq was rather chaotic. Uh, in summary, uh, most of 2003 and 2004 uh, were spent uh, with the initial invasion of Iraq, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom One, uh, occurring early in 2003, and then adjusting to the post-war uh, situation in Iraq after Saddam Hussein's forces were defeated. In this chaotic uh, post-war situation, it took uh, months for the U.S. Uh, forces and the U.S. political leaders to recognize that uh, the situation in Iraq was uh, much different than what they expected. And in fact, uh, insurgencies had bro broken out throughout the country. By 2006, you had at least uh, four uh, major uh, problems, uh, insurgent type problems existing in Iraq. One was uh, an insurgency led by foreign fighters known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Another insurgency focused on, on, in Al Anbar province and was a insurgency led by former Ba'athist and Sunni uh, Iraqi nationalists. Uh, there was a third insurgency uh, built around uh, Shiite militias uh, taking place in Baghdad and areas north and uh, east of Baghdad. And then a fourth general criminal criminal element which allied itself uh, with the various insurgencies at different times. Uh, the US in 2006 had not come up with a decent uh, or a workable counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq that uh, met the needs of providing security for the, the Iraqi people and stability sufficient for uh, the establishment of a stable Iraqi indigenous government. Uh, in 2006, uh, the U.S. was rotating various uh, Army and Marine brigade-sized units into Iraq 
on a 12 month rotational uh, policy and then uh, assigning them to various uh, urban areas around Iraq uh, with the mission of providing security. Uh, in most cases, the security these brigades were able to provide uh, was uh, marginal at best. And one exception was uh, in uh, the city of Telafar, where the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, of, uh, commanded by then Colonel H.R. Uh, McMaster, had implemented a unique uh, and to that point uh, new uh, insurgent or counterinsurgency strategy based on the idea of seizing terrain, holding it, and then uh, uh, passing that uh, terrain off to, uh, to indigenous Iraqi forces. The 3rd Armored Cavalry rotated out of Iraq and were replaced by a new brigade coming from Germany, the 1st Brigade Combat Team of the 1st Armored Division. Three months or uh, after arriving in Iraq, that brigade, the 1st Brigade Combat Team uh, of the 1st Armored Division was ordered south to reinforce the Marines, uh, U.S. Marine Command, uh, which had responsibility for Western Iraq and all of al Anbar province. And at that point in March, or correction, in June of 2006, the 1st Brigade com Combat Team came under the control of uh, the 1st Marine Division uh, with its headquarters in Fallujah and was assigned responsibility for pacifying uh, the, air, uh, the city of Ramadi and the area around that city. At the time in 2006, Ramadi was considered the deadliest city in Iraq. And uh, with the exception of uh, forward operating bases that the U.S. had positioned in and around the city, uh, the bulk of the city and its population were controlled uh, by insurgents and the primary or the, the supreme insurgent movement in uh, Ramadi was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which consisted of somewhere between uh, 800 and 1,500 uh, foreign fighters. This map shows you uh, how the city is uh, uh, located just south of the Euphrates River and uh, the location of some of the major important terrain features. The, ver the, the very dark brown areas indicate uh, the dense uh, downtown areas of Iraq and then the sur uh, surrounding areas in white are generally uh, the suburbs, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the downtown areas of Ramadi and the white areas are generally the suburbs uh, surrounding the more dense urban terrain in the downtown areas. Uh, and you can see north, just north of the city where the city literally uh, is adjacent to uh, the Euphrates River uh, running from uh, west to east. Uh, in addition, an important terrain feature is the Habanya Canal, which uh, splits off from the Euphrates River and divides the city moving uh, from uh, north to south. And then uh, with the, uh, the bulk of the downtown area on the west, or correction, the east side of the uh, canal. Uh, the important military uh, bases at the beginning of this operation are Camp Ramadi, no located in the uh, northeast part of the city. Uh, and that becomes the major staging base for the 1st Brigade Combat Team. In addition, uh, there are several other camps uh, located uh, in the city. Hurricane Point, which is at the junction or vicinity of the junction of the canal and the Euphrates River. Uh, and that is the uh, operating base of the Marine contingent in this battle. And then to the east of the, of the city is Camp Corregidor, uh, another major camp operated by a light infantry battalion, a US light infantry battalion. Two important terrain features uh, in the downtown area are the modern hospital uh, located uh, in the middle of, or in the northeast corner of the uh, northwest corner of the city downtown, as well as the gov central government building. Both of those buildings, particularly the central government building, were important to the Americans, and the central government building was responsible of the Marine uh, units. To the west of the canal, you see uh, in the uh, suburb of Tamin, uh, the the University District, uh, and on the southern border of the city, you see uh, a, uh, a 
railroad uh, line that runs uh, from uh, west to east, uh, connecting the city with uh, ultimately all the way to the uh, west to Syria and to the east through Fallujah to Baghdad. So these are the main features. There are two major highways that are also important to this battle. On the north side uh, is a major four-lane highway uh, known, uh, codenamed by the Americans MSR Mobile. And then running just south of Camp Ramadi across the canal and then directly through the downtown area and past Camp Corregidor is another major supply route codenamed uh, Michigan. Here you have a couple of views of what the city looked like. Um, from the aerial view that you see there, the dominant picture is the suburbs area, area just south of the Euphrates River. And then you see a picture of the downtown streets uh, in Ramadi. Ramadi uh, as a city was uh, originated at, uh, fairly late in the history of Iraq in 18, uh, 69. Um, and because of that, it's not built along tradition, traditional Arab city lines. There is no um, Kasbah old city downtown area, which you find in, in all of the older cities uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the city itself uh, was designed along more along European standards with wide paved streets and uh, modern concrete buildings. Uh, the city hospital itself is the largest building in the downtown area, uh, seven stories tall, and there were numerous other five and six uh, story buildings. But uh, the dominant uh, architecture was the typical low uh, two to three story tall uh, concrete uh, flat top roofed uh, Middle Eastern uh, building. Uh, and that certainly was the uh, dominant architecture in the suburbs and residential areas. At the time of the arrival of First Brigade in uh, June of uh, 2006, the city had no power, the city had no running water, there was no garbage disposal, there was no functioning city government and no phone service, either land, uh, landline or cell phone service. Um, <coughs> the garbage di di disposal issue is, is, uh, has some importance that is that you might not think of in addition to the uh, hygienic uh, issues associated with that uh, over several years of basically uh, no city services. The, uh, the city streets had been covered uh, with dirt. And so although they were modern paved streets, they were covered with dirt and strewn with debris. Also, Ramadi had been subject to numerous artillery coalition, artillery and air attacks. And the rubble from those uh, attacks lined the city streets. And this was important because it made it very easy uh, to hide improvised explosive devices uh, along the routes utilized by the coalition forces as they traveled through the city. Uh, basically, uh, although uh, prior to the Iraqi war, uh, Ramadi was one of the most modern cities in Iraq. Uh, by the time the 1st Brigade combat team arrived there uh, in 2006, it was a war-torn city uh, with no modern services. So the 1st Brigade combat team uh, was deployed from Germany uh, for combat in Iraq in, uh, in January of 2006. Uh, it was a ra rather large American Army Armored Brigade. Uh, and during the combat in Ramadi consisted of five maneuver battalions, two light infantry battalions, one of which uh, was a Marine, U.S. Marine Corps battalion, a mechanized infantry battalion, and two M1 Abrams equipped tank battalions. In addition, in support, the 1st Brigade Combat Team had an engineer uh, battalion, uh, a self-propelled artillery battalion, and a general support logistics battalion. Two other unique uh, attachments that the that the brigade had was uh, are indicated on this slide on the left side. Uh, one was two uh, platoons of Navy U.S. Navy SEALs, and the other was a U.S. Navy Riverine uh, boat unit. Uh, giving the uh, organization the ability to patrol the rivers and the canal uh, with uh, these uh, Navy boats. However, they did not come with Navy crew. And so these boats were assigned to the Marine Battalion who manned uh, the Riverine uh, craft 
with uh, U.S. Marines. Upon its arrival in uh, Ramadi in uh, June of 2006, uh, the 1st Brigade uh, dispositions were as you, roughly as you see uh, on this slide. Uh, the Mechanized Infantry Battalion, 1st Battalion, 6th Infantry was given responsibility uh, for the city north of the river, uh, generally a suburbs area. Uh, the Armor Battalion, 1st Battalion, 35th Armor was given responsibility for uh, the Tamin suburbs and the Al Anbar University uh, on the east side of the canal. That battalion though was based out of Camp Ramadi itself, uh, but its uh, military operations were conducted in the uh, Tamin suburb. Uh, the 1st Battalion uh, 37th Armor was given responsibility for the downtown area south of the governance uh, center. And uh, that battalion was also based out of Camp Ramadi. 3rd Battalion of the 8th Marines based out of Hurricane Point Combat Outpost was responsible for the downtown area, including the governance uh, center and north to the Euphrates River. And then finally, 1st Battalion of the 506th Infantry uh, based at Camp Corregidor on the east side of the, of the city was responsible uh, for the east side of the city uh, south of the Euphrates River. Uh, by the base positioning of these battalions, they were in a good position to interdict, uh, interdict traffic coming into the city, either from, the, uh, from any direction, uh, particularly the east, west, or north. Uh, south of Ramadi, once uh, you get past the railroad line, uh, is generally uninhabited uh, and open desert. And so there was not much of a threat of infiltration of uh, insurgents from that direction. Uh, but uh, moving east and west were a series of suburbs and, uh, and small villages and towns that, uh, that uh, economically uh, uh, were positioned to take advantage of the Euphrates River and the highways uh, that the Iraqi government had constructed parallel, paralleling the Euphrates River. Uh, prior to the arrival of 1st Brigade, uh, the previous unit uh, in Ramadi, the 2nd Brigade of the 28th Infantry Division, Pennsylvania National Guard, had uh, generally contented itself with uh, controlling the major supply routes, Michigan in the north, or I'm sorry, Mobile in the north and Michigan in the center, uh, controlling the governance center and, uh, and ensuring the uh, protection of, uh, of coalition supply and other type of units that moved along those routes. Uh, there was not uh, an aggressive plan, uh, primarily because the 28th, uh, the second brigade of the 28th division uh, did not have as much combat power as, uh, as a light infantry brigade with no tanks or Bradleys as uh, the first brigade had, and therefore they uh, limited their mission. The leadership of the 1st Brigade and other important leaders. So 1st Brigade of 1st uh, Armored Division was led by Colonel Sean McFarland, uh, who had commanded the brigade for uh, about six months before it arrived in Iraq. And uh, by the time it got to Ramadi, had been in command for about a year. And um, McFarland was an experienced officer with uh, over 20 years uh, service in the U.S. Army and a graduate of West Point uh, and had served in uh, uh, Operation Desert Storm, as well as uh, U.S. operations in Kosovo. Uh, an important player and leader uh, on the uh, Iraqi side, uh, allied with uh, the 1st Brigade, was Sheikh Abdul Sattar al Rasha. Uh, and Sheikh Sattar uh, led uh, the civilian forces. Um, and was really the informal leader of all of the uh, Sunni forces allied with the uh, with the Americans uh, in the Battle of Ramadi. Uh, he had started out, or he was a uh, a minor sheikh within the tribal hierarchy of uh, the Sunni tribes that uh, made up 95% of the population of El Anbar province. Uh, but uh, with the arrival of Al Qaeda uh, in Iraq. Uh, most of the senior sheiks 
had uh, had uh, left the country, uh, moving uh, into neighboring countries, primarily Jordan, and conducted their their leadership by telephone and messenger uh, from outside of uh, Iraq, where they were safe from uh, uh, reprisals or threats uh, from Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, Sheikh Sadr, though, remained behind and. Uh, and because he remained personally behind in Ramadi and because there's a very, although young, a very charismatic uh, uh, personality uh, had uh, kind of filled a uh, power vacuum uh, among the indigenous Iraq leadership. As I mentioned before, uh, there was no uh, in place formal uh, city council or mayor in Ramadi. And so what governance existed, existed through the tribal leaderships uh, of the various clans uh, in the city. And the population of Ramadi was uh, about 400,000 uh, civilians. So it's a big city, uh, almost 100 square miles of terrain. The city kind of rough uh, boundaries of the city, uh, east to west, nine, uh, 11 miles, and north to south, nine miles. Uh, and so a big city with a big population and no governance and so uh, what uh, control there was of the civilian population rested with the traditional families and uh, clan and tribal leaders of which uh, at the time of the arrival of First Brigade, uh, Sheikh Sadr was one of, the, uh, one of the most prominent. And then the final person that I'll point out here is uh, uh, Captain uh, Travis Patriquin. Uh, uh, Captain Patriquin is the uh, a staff officer in the 1st Brigade, uh, and he was in charge of civil affairs. He has a unique or had a unique background uh, in the Army in that uh, he had been a Special Forces uh, Green Beret officer, uh, served in Afghanistan as a Special Forces team leader, and then had transferred back to the regular Army uh, as a regular Army infantryman uh, and had initially been assigned to the, uh, to the Brigade Operations Office in 1st Brigade. However, uh, the captain was a fluent Arab speaker uh, and had immersed himself uh, on his own initi initiative in Arab culture. Uh, and quickly, uh, he was identified uh, by Colonel McFarland as having a unique skill set that made him ideally suited to be the Brigade uh, Civil Affairs Officer and then and then later uh, dubbed the uh, brigade uh, liaison to, uh, to the Iraqi civil forces that would uh, be organized informally under uh, Sheikh Sadr, but uh, more formally as the Iraqi police. And so these three individuals uh, together formed uh, the mili military and the political strategy which ultimately uh, achieved success in the Battle of Ramadi. On the opposite side, there were three different uh, insurgent forces operating in uh, Ramadi at the time of the battle. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, uh, under national control of the uh, infamous uh, terrorist or uh, Al-Qaeda leader, Abdul uh, Musab al-Zarqawi, uh, Sunni insurgents, uh, who were uh, affiliated with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, but not under their control. And then criminal elements who uh, for, uh, uh, for hire would work with either of the other two insurgent groups. This was the mission given to 1st Brigade uh, uh, by uh, General Zil Zilner, the US Marine Corps commander of the 1st Marine Division and the commander of multinational forces in Western Iraq. Uh, basically all of El Anbar province. And it's a very general, fix Ramadi, but don't do a Fallujah. And what he is referring to is the earlier, more famous uh, Marine battle in Fallujah, where in a two week period, the Marines uh, secured the city of Fallujah, but in the process uh, essentially destroyed the city uh, as part of saving it, as the infamous uh, saying goes. And so the intent of General Zimmer was that uh, Ramadi be pacified, but it be pacified with a minimum of violence and, uh, and a minimum of uh, damage to the civilian infrastructure or loss of civilian life. 
one of the very first things um, that uh, Captain Patrico and uh, Colonel McFarland determined was that uh, a city the size of Ramadi could not be pacified with just the combat power of a single US Army uh, brigade and that they would need support from Iraqi forces. Uh, and in particular, they would need the support of the local population. And uh, the most important element to getting that support uh, was to uh, form an alliance with the sheiks. Uh, an alliance with the sheiks would enable them uh, to recruit indigenous Iraqi forces uh, and uh, into the local police force. And that police force would provide, along with the uh, Iraqi army, would provide the numbers uh, that the brigade needed to hold uh, the city once uh, the American forces had uh, dealt with the threat of the Al-Qaeda insurgents. Interestingly enough, a lot of the Sunni insurgents uh, before the arrival of 1st Brigade uh, were controlled also by the Sheiks. And, uh, but at the, at the time of the arrival of 1st Brigade in June of 2006, it was a break occurring between the Sunni insurgents and Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was trying to dominate politically uh, the, the province and subordinate uh, the Sunni insurgents and their leadership. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was primarily a, uh, a uh, radical uh, Islamic inspired group while the Sunni insurgents, although they were not completely secular, were more motivated by Iraqi nationalist and economic uh, concerns. The Sunnis of El Anbar province had been um, the force behind Saddam Hussein's Iraqi government. And with the American invasion, they had lost both their political power and a lot of their economic uh, capability. And, uh, and they were intent on creating some kind of uh, autonomous uh, capability uh, to, uh, to regain some political power and uh, regain their uh, economic control of uh, the province. Uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, on the other hand, uh, wouldn't toler uh, was not tolerant of uh, some of the secular economic activity uh, of the insurgents and certainly was not tolerant of the uh, Sunni insurgent leadership. And so at the time the first brigade arrived, uh, what was happening was a mini civil war between the Sunnis uh, the indigenous uh, Sunnis of the province and the mostly foreign fighter dominated Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And 1st Brigade took advantage of this uh, to convince the Sunni uh, sheiks uh, that uh, their best chance of achieving uh, some political autonomy and regaining uh, economic power was to break off their common cause with Al-Qaeda and join uh, with uh, the Americans and uh, primarily by uh, facilitating the enlistment of young Sunni men, some of them uh, former insurgents into the Iraqi police who were then equipped and trained by the Americans and provided an important critical uh, support structure uh, to the combat operations of 1st Brigade. This was a new approach in Iraq, integrating the, uh, the sheiks and their tribes and their particularly their military age young men in support of the American effort. Uh, a unique slide uh, show was put together uh, that explained uh, the Sunni awakening, the motivations of the Iraqis and how those motivations could be aligned with US goals in the country. And this uh, slideshow was put together by uh, Captain uh, Captain Patriquin and uh, distributed throughout 1st Brigade and ultimately was distributed throughout US forces and uh, 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 was commonly uh, viewed uh, in higher headquarters, including the Pentagon. And in very simple terms, it basically made the point uh, that by understanding uh, the culture, the tribal structure and motivations of the local Sunnis, they could be won over to the U.S. side, and because of their cultural knowledge, uh, they would solve one of the major problems that the Americans had, which was separating 
out among the Arab population who were civilians, who were uh, friendly uh, uh, Iraqi forces like the Sunni militias that could be integrated into the police force and who were the foreign fighters who were uh, the sworn enemies of the Americans. In addition to winning over uh, the local population, the other key uh, to the success of the 1st Brigade in Ramadi was this uh, operational concept called cop in a box. And it was basically, uh, as depicted here, a six step process. And the idea was pick a, uh, a group of buildings in downtown Ramadi uh, as an ink spot that would be built in a, to a secure, friendly Iraqi uh, an American controlled area. It began with uh, the SEAL teams uh, doing a reconnaissance to identify the right group of buildings. Once uh, the location was selected, the SEAL teams were tasked with going in at night and securing the central building uh, and evacuating the family that was there. Uh, they would go in with an interpreter and as they took over these buildings and uh, displaced the Iraqi families, the Iraqi families would be uh, compensated $25,000 or $2,500 uh, for the use of their building. Once the SEALs had secured the building, a uh, U.S. Uh, heavy task force or heavy company team equipped with mine and road clearing equipment would move to reinforce the SEALs and clear the route of IEDs uh, between uh, the base camp uh, where the Americans started and the uh, combat outpost position. Once that company team had linked up with the SEALs, the SEALs moved further out and set up sniper positions to cover the approaches uh, to the combat outpost while the conventional infantry reinforced the combat outpost. Simultaneously, combat engineers uh, moved to the combat outpost with sandbags and concrete pillars uh, used to reinforce and fortify the combat outpost. Once the combat outpost was firmly established, uh, the U.S. Army uh, company uh, would be reinforced by Iraqi Army company and begin patrolling the area while the SEALs uh, retained uh, a uh, observation posts and sniper positions on the perimeter. Uh, as they patrolled those areas, uh, typically the Iraqi insurgents would counterattack and counterattacking through the Navy SEAL snipers and into the fortified positions of uh, the Iraqi army and the uh, and US armies in the combat outpost gave every advantage to the American forces. And, and this was the primary means of eliminating insurgents. Uh, once the insurgents had spent themselves on the combat outpost uh, and more patrols had extended the perimeter, uh, the Iraqi police forces uh, were moved into the combat outpost to establish, establish civilian control of the area and the Iraqi army and US army uh, units, as well as the SEALs were available for further missions. And so this cop in a box uh, SOP was used to establish a small footprint and then expand it uh, and uh, systematically secure the city of Iraq or Ramadi. And kind of uh, uh, visually, it looks like this. So initial positions were the pre-established forward operating bases on the perimeter of the city. And those became the basis for moving uh, uh, in a, uh, in a predetermined systematic pattern out of those bases, establishing cops uh, and then expanding those cops and then using those cops to ultimately uh, as a base to move out and establish more cops. And so over the period of the summer of 2006 and through the fall of 2006, uh, the, uh, the uh, combat uh, battalions of the 1st Brigade uh, did this in a systematic manner. Uh, every, uh, at a random intervals, sometimes uh, uh, establishing cops in quick succession of uh, several, two or three cops over in, uh, in the period of uh, several days or a week and then uh, pausing sometimes uh, for several weeks before beginning to move to new positions. And the point here was uh, to keep the Al-Qaeda insurgents uh, from uh, understanding where and when uh, the American forces would arrive and quickly establish these, uh, these fortified positions. But 
uh, by the time you get to January of uh, 2007. So this was not a fast process. Uh, by January 2007, seven months into operations in Ramadi, the, uh, most of the city had been secured. And by uh, the spring of 2007, less than a year uh, after operations uh, began, Al-Qaeda in Iraq had pretty much been eliminated uh, in Ramadi, uh, well, had been eliminated in Ramadi. Uh, the Sunni insurgency had been co-opted through the Sunni awakening on the, uh, to be allied with the Americans and the criminal element had been suppressed or also integrated uh, back into the legitimate forces uh, allied with the Americans and the Iraqi government. Uh, the city was so secured that in the spring of 2007, uh, far from being the most dangerous city in, uh, in Iraq. In fact, uh, uh, the coalition forces and uh, the civilian population were able to st stage a 10 kilometer uh, road race in downtown, uh, foot race in downtown Ramadi uh, in which both military and civilian personnel participated and uh, without significant uh, security concerns. And so, uh, in about uh, uh, less than a 12 month period, uh, you, the uh, first brigade was able to uh, make, change the security situation in Ramadi from uh, the most dangerous city in the country to a city in which um, uh, a uh, 10 kilometer uh, foot race uh, could be uh, staged uh, in which allied uh, forces could participate. A, huge uh, change. It did not come uh, at a small price though. Uh, over the course of that, of its period in uh, Ramadi, the 1st Brigade estimates that it, uh, about 1,500 uh, insurgent fighters were killed and about 1,500 additional were captured uh, and turned over uh, to the forces of the Iraqi government. Uh, in that time period, 1st uh, Brigade lost 83 soldiers killed in action. Uh, including, unfortunately, uh, Captain uh, uh, Trequin, who was killed uh, uh, by a roadside uh, improvised explosive device. Uh, several hundred soldiers in addition were wounded, and over the course of the battle, 25 vehicles uh, were destroyed. But the legacy uh, of the Battle of Ramadi uh, is important. Uh, with uh, approximately one third or one quarter of the combat power that was used uh, in the Battle of Fallujah, uh, the 1st Brigade of the 1st Armored Division was able to secure a city that was almost four times the size of the city of Fallujah. And the Sunni awakening and the cop pacification tactical approach uh, became the political and the tactical model that uh, General uh, Petraeus later uh, implemented uh, in the successful surge of U.S. forces to Iraq, uh, which ultimately uh, uh, was successful in establishing relative uh, security uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the country uh, before the general uh, withdrawal of U.S. forces in 2010-2011. So that's kind of the short-term legacy. Um, in comparison to the more famous Battle of Fallujah, uh, it basically offered an alternate approach to pacifying a large urban area. In the case of Fallujah, uh, successful pacification occurred uh, through overwhelming use of combat power uh, and rapid military action, but at the cost of uh, significant destruction in the city and uh, without winning over uh, the population uh, to the uh, uh, political cause of the allies or the Iraqi government. On the other hand, in contrast, the Battle of Ramadi showed with a limited amount of combat power uh, and a systematic uh, but time-consuming approach, uh, you could achieve the same results with uh, much fewer uh, damage to the infrastructure of the city uh, and at the same time, uh, win over the political allegiance of the local leaders and uh, the local civilian population. Long term, however, there is a critique of the approach taken in the Battle of Ramadi 
Uh, and you can see in this uh, recently published book, Illusions of Victory, which takes into account the fact that uh, after the rise, rise of ISIS uh, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, ISIS uh, caliphate forces were able to recapture Ramadi from the Iraqi government after the US forces had departed relatively easy. Uh, and part of this, uh, some uh, authors ascribe to the fact that in the process of limit, uh, liberating Ramadi in 2006 with the help of the Sunni Arabs, uh, the Americans empowered uh, the Sunni Arab leadership and, um, and uh, fostered uh, separatist views among the Sunnis vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the Shiite-dominated Iraqi government. And then when the American uh, forces left Iraq and the national government uh, came to be even more dominated by the Shiite, uh, those uh, Sunni uh, leaders in Al Anbar were looking for an ally, and that ally uh, took the form of ISIS. And therefore, um, the leadership that was loyal to the Americans uh, had no trouble uh, later after the Americans uh, departed in transferring that loyalty to a new sponsor, and that new sponsor was the ISIS uh, Caliphate. Uh, operating out of Syria, and then uh, which quickly took control of both Fallujah and Ramadi as part of its uh, invasion uh, of Iraq and uh, came close to uh, uh, seriously threatening uh, the Iraqi national government. So uh, what we're going to do now uh, is, uh, is uh, remain online and uh, live and uh, if you have questions uh, you can uh, send them through the chat and uh, and I will attempt to answer those questions. And so as we wait for questions, um, the, uh, I might mention that uh, the US commander in Iraq, uh, Colonel McFarland went on to a, a distinguished uh, army career uh, and retired as, as a three-star general. Uh, Sheikh Sadr, uh, who facilitated the uh, Sunni uh, uprising in Ramadi, uh, one of his goals was uh, to someday uh, have a personal meeting with President Bush and, and he achieved that goal. But unfortunately, because of his influence and his, uh, among uh, the Sunnis uh, and uh, also because of his alliance with the, uh, with the uh, Americans, he became a target of Al Qaeda and was assassinated. Uh, and so, you know, not all the heroes of the Battle of Ramadi uh, survived. Uh, one of the other uh, influential characters that, uh, or personalities that I mentioned uh, was uh, Colonel H.R. McMaster, who had, uh, who first brigaded worked with and kind of uh, learned many of their tactical techniques, including uh, the concept of the combat outpost uh, in Telefar. Uh, and of course, uh, Colonel McMaster went on to become uh, General McMaster and uh, a national security advisor to President Trump. Okay, uh, well, it appears that we, uh, we don't have uh, any questions coming through. And so uh, I'd like to take a minute uh, just to say that it was my pleasure to uh, maybe uh, highlight some of the accomplishments. Uh, one of the first really successful counterinsurgency accomplishment of American forces in Iraq and particularly the soldiers of the 1st Brigade uh, combat team and the Marines uh, and sailors and airmen who uh, worked with them uh, in the Battle of Ramadi, 
setting the stage uh, a few years later for the surge of American forces in Iraq. And, uh, and I did get one question regarding the displaced Iraqis. Um, were they, uh, where were they moved when uh, they were basically evicted from their house? Uh, basically, those displaced families were turned over uh, to uh, the Iraqi leadership and, uh, and through uh, the tribal connections uh, were uh, placed in uh, temporary housing until they could eventually get back to occupy their original uh, homes. They were not, uh, you know, one of the advantages of working closely uh, with the indigenous leadership, uh, the sheiks of uh, Ramadi, uh, was that uh, uh, the uh, tribes and clans have extensive personal and family relations uh, throughout, not just the city, but throughout the province. And so uh, taking care of, uh, of uh, the families of the tribe is one of the primary uh, responsibilities of, uh, of the sheiks, the tribal leadership. And so uh, they were placed uh, in, in the hands of the indigenous Iraqi leadership and with the funds, uh, the comp uh, compensatory funds provided the Americans, uh, that was not a major problem. Okay, and if there are no other questions, then I would just like to say that, uh, again, it was my pleasure talking to you. And uh, let me see if there are maybe a, a few lingering questions. No. Yeah, uh, no, I think that wraps up the question portion. And so again, it was my pleasure talking to you and I hope uh, uh, you learned something about uh, what might be, what I think is uh, the piv most pivotal, pivotal uh, battle uh, of the Iraq war. Um, and one which has not received uh, as much publicity, um, probably because it was not your traditional uh, house to house type uh, urban warfare battle along the Fallujah model. Uh, and so has not received as much publicity as it uh, deserves. But I think uh, as more and more histories uh, of the Iraq war are written, uh, the battle of Ramadi will be highlighted as a turning point uh, for the American efforts in Iraq. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for our program this afternoon. If you are a student and would like to join the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Refer to doleinstitute.org for up-to-date information on all of our upcoming programs. If you enjoyed today's program, consider becoming a friend of the Dole Institute by donating to help make programs like this possible. We hope you enjoyed this afternoon's program. Thank you, and we will virtually see you next time.